Who's the best space dog? Oh, di moya horoshaya, horoshen kaya moya, ti prosto kosmichiskaya. Hey, who's the best hairy cosmonaut? It is indeed a lovely sunset, and it reminds me of the skies of Peru. I didn't. I never told you about the wonderful sky city. Well, it was an extraordinary place, but one filled with dangers. Well, it might have been simple for you to cross it, but you were in a space capsule. I had to rely on my own two feet, my noshki. Feet which, I might add, had just crossed the interior, beaten the villain tall, and helped inspire the Mienk to a workers' revolution. Oh, that's all very easy for you to say, but your idea of civilized behavior is licking your own bottom in public. No. My adventures above the clouds were filled with untold dangers, death-defying escapes, and some really quite extraordinarily large Bielaribitsa. And it happened like this. Weeks had passed since I left Plutonia, and one evening, exhausted, I simply fell asleep at the foot of a strange windmill. And when I awoke, well, that thought didn't cross my mind. I was exhausted after all. This is besides the point, my nosy canine friend. What matters is this. When I awoke, the windmill and the ground around it had been carried high into the air. What magic was this? Toza magia. <laughs> Uh, as unlikely, perhaps, as a suitcase-sized dog orbiting the center of the Earth for many years. <laughs> Quite. Quick as a flash, Kakmonia, my training leapt into play, and I began to paddle the strange contraption through the clouds in search of answers. <laughs> It is entirely possible that a miller who owns a windmill capable of levitating high into the air may also own a flying machine. Oh, now you're just being silly. May I continue my recounting of how I sailed over the sky gardens towards the mystical city of Peru? Oh, I must, my moe ushatidrug. I must. What powerful emanations! What mighty gusts! What an epic squall! They reminded me of Cousin Pavel, yes! But whereas his rearward zephyrs could curdle milk and tarnish the teaspoons, these magical wafts only serve to carry me aloft and onwards.
But something was afoot in the gardens of Perun. This horrid muck staining the surfaces and making my nose curl. <laughs> yes, it was positively uh, Pavelian in scent. But it did not belong here. I think I once told you of Auntie Marsha's passionate encounter in a cable car with the manganese entrepreneur from Chiatura. <laughs> Now, Auntie Masha told me that there was a disagreeable stain and smell all around those factories and smelting works. Our industry is not without its dangers. Could it be that the once bucolic gardens of Perun were being corrupted by unchecked pollution? After all, science is a double-edged sword, my bristly confidant. <laughs> Consider Zemikov. <laughs> Of course, of course. I apologize. Prashu prashenya. Two-headed dogs is perhaps a rather insensitive analogy, but not without justification in this instance. I have seen the blemished lands around Narilsk, but I could not believe that I would find such pollution here. But this was nothing, nothing to the true horror of what was shortly to unfold. Terrible, strashnaya machina spewing its poison into the air had created a monstrous thing. A being, a malignant spoiler of the noble and pure, and it had taken on the form of its prey. Well, of course. No, Kanyeshna, I was the prey. The citizens of Perun had clearly long since fled the evilly sentient smog, but I inadvertently wandered into its lair. Oh, I know, I know. Misfortune seemed to dog me. Oh, sorry, I do apologize. To follow my every footstep. But no time to ponder. No time to bemoan the hand that fate had dealt me. No, all that was on my mind was escape Kanishna. Yes, it was most interesting. The windmill seemed to be from an earlier age. Perhaps this was a devastating warning of the destructive power of unfettered industrialization. I most certainly had not forgotten about the windmills. I did not get carried away. You are missing the point, perhaps because you are only a small dog. Oh, a brilliant, brave, spacefaring dog, of course, but a small Sabashka nonetheless. If you perhaps listened more and interrupted less, I am just getting to the explanation of the windmills. My stinky nemesis was back. But more interesting was the change in the city. The windmills were fading out, clearly obsoleted, mothballed, 
relics. Instead, a sense of an obsession with power was apparent. Vast engines, terrible machines, ever hungry and reliant on the rapid consumption of fuel, the production of toxic fumes, and choking gases. Pride, my pushisti compadre, pride, ambition, ambition, the dark side of science, Zemechov's head too many. Oh, don't be ridiculous, dog. Only a durak with the intellectual capacity of a ringworm would think windmills are in any way harmful. Of course, you never had much of a chance to travel. <laughs> Sarcasm doesn't suit you. You don't have the tail for it. You do at least have a tail. Mind you, family gossip maintained that so did Uncle Rabliam. Although it was apparently little more than a stub and a source of considerable discomfort and social anxiety for him. The question of whether or not Uncle Rabliam wagged his stub is very much off topic. What I am trying to say is that your upbringing on the streets of Moscow meant you never saw the blackened fields of Magnitogorsk, the sacrifices made by the valiant citizens of that industrial heartland, as they drowned in their own blight, even as they powered the state forwards. I was reminded of Magnitogorsk as I wandered through those fields of pipes and foundries. And I wept for the loss of innocence that so often goes hand in hand with progress. <laughs>
Indeed. I just evaded the slimy, oily grasp of that man-made Vajinoi, his petroleum stink clogging my nostrils and making my head thump. And I felt a great stirring within me. <laughs> <laughs> yes, much like I assume Cousin Pavel. May he never get loose again. <laughs> but no, quite different. This was no volcanic upbubbling of gastric malintent. No, it was the roaring fires of justice once more ignited within me. I felt a swell of patriotic fervor and knew the hand of destiny had fallen on me once more. Yes, what a hand it was. I could not see this great wonder sink into an abyss of poison and bile. The Perunians may have been forced to abandon their city, but I had saved the world once before and was ready to answer the call again. What strange metal bilaribitsa clearly designed to swim through the air? I was amazed. And there was more. Beneath the fins, I spotted the apertures of hoses and was reminded of the time Auntie Agrafina devised a contraption to water all of her copious algae beds simultaneously with one flush of the toilet by a system of pipes and valves that ran throughout her house. Orzhna Takskazait, in a manner of speaking, yes. Her algae were most irrigated, although her neighbor Victor was washing his trousers in the sink at the time and was bruised quite severely about the face and body. But these were no ordinary flying metal fish. They were designed to expel air, fresh air, and push back the polluted clouds. There is, of course, a fine tradition of looking to nature to solve problems of a scientific or military persuasion. Yes, as you well know, my nephew, Sergei, yes, the very same. Poor lad with his dermatological eruptions. Well, Sergei was stationed recently at Kazacha Buchta, where dolphins, <laughs> dolphins, were being trained as brilliant aquatic agents of socialism. Why not then be inspired by marine life? Why, there is a fish, I have heard, that can shoot jets of water from beneath the surface to knock its prey off little tiny twigs and into its mouth. <laughs> if you were to tell the average mushroom sheriff that a dog would orbit the earth, I suspect you would receive a similarly sneering response. You know, that is because you are a small, hairy hound of uncertain parentage. I, on the other hand, am a cosmonaut, the product of many months of training.
It made perfect sense, of course. <laughs> the poisonous Duhata that engulfed Barun was like a nasty cold. <laughs> and you know what to do with a cold to rid yourself of it. <laughs> you may not get colds, but nor can you operate pea shelling machinery. So don't get ideas above your station. We humans, on the other hand, may produce up to 16 million perfectly unshelled peas in an average shift. But we are martyrs to our sinuses. <laughs> but to clear them, aha, these are remedies we Russians have been perfecting over the long centuries of harsh winters. <laughs> Onions. A quick snifter of onion oil will clear your head faster than a Pragviev can clear a hypothetical minefield. Yes, if I could find a functional fish, I would become that onion. <laughs> Yes, the working fish, the Ripka. I could feel I was at the heart of Perun, and my noxious pursuer had renewed its chase with a terrible vigor. Not far now. I just had to keep going, keep pushing. It's almost as if you knew, Pavel. Uncanny, double tilt. There she was. A beautiful sight, her scales shimmering in the sunlight, her fins poised for action, her onion cannons primed for a great aerial conflict unseen in the annals of human endeavor. And you are just jealous it was a bigger flying machine than yours. No, my pilious pal. It was time for science to fight back. Yes, my hairy compatriot. Paechale, onwards to victory.
was a miracle. I found myself swooping through beautiful clear skies. The strange interior sunlight gleaming on the sides of my fishy vessel. I heard birds clear their little throats and begin their wondrous gvalt. The wind gently humming on the fins. And then, all of a sudden, under it all... Well, you see, in my hurry, it didn't even occur to me to check how much fuel was carried in the strange craft. With a horrible splutter, the engines choked and died. And suddenly we were plummeting downwards towards our doom. I did not. A simple mistake that many have made. Why, my Aunt Agrafina met her untimely demise being late for a fungal sculpting seminar and making exactly the same error. Only, unfortunately, it left her stranded in sub-zero temperatures just outside Pravachitsinsky. She wasn't found until 18 years after her own funeral, but was perfectly preserved. Remarkable, really. It is beside the point, yes. So, there I was. My fabulous ship had become a terrible prison. I was hurtling to my almost certain death. My triumph turned to tragedy. But then... Well, you know what happened next. Even so, moi magnati drug, that is a story for another time. A most extraordinary story, of course, filled with dangers and wonders and canals and invasions and the strange doorways to other worlds. But perhaps too long a story for now. <laughs> yes, indeed, my canine tavarish. Time for soup. Auntie Agrafina's famous borscht. Coming? You know, I think you really did have the happier time in Peru. <laughs> yeah, the benefits of being a suitcase-sized dog in a little space machine, perhaps. <laughs> ah, yes, the correct term is indeed capsule, as I told the general once. <laughs> Why, a letter just the other week? He's thinking of retiring, he says. Yes, and moving to Bashkiria to nurture bees. <laughs> bees? surprised me too. I thought if animal husbandry was to be his passion, it would be a large, manly animal like elk or bears or a caban. <laughs> Perhaps the bees he is thinking of are particularly militaristic. <laughs> or stingy, yes. <laughs> Did you want bread with your soup? <laughs> In which case, there's half a tin of old beef you could also finish. Somewhat gray, but uh, uh, I'm sure it won't taste awful. <laughs> yes, my four-legged associate. Now, did I ever tell you the story of when Uncle Rablien got his stub ensnared in the seat of a wicker chair in the finest fish restaurant in the whole of Taliatsi? 